and will forever be part of the cultural landscape of 20th century popular music. There is a wonderful song in the great Lerner and Lowe musical Brigadoon called Almost Like Being in Love. Part of the lyric goes, and I quote, all the music of life seems to be like a bell that is ringing for me, end quote. For me, Judy Garland was and always will be all the music of life. Thank you. Oh, sure, okay. Um, we're supposed to do a question and answer, so um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Questions, please, anything on your mind? Yes, please. Hi, um, you said you lived in Paris. Yes. Um, I don't know if you could really answer this, but what was, uh, was she very popular in France? I mean, what was the, um, the following? Well, you have to remember that um, um, most of the films she did in the 30s and 40s were during the war years. So all of those films which made her so popular in the United States didn't get to Europe because of the war. So it, it really wasn't until A Star is Born in 1954 that she began to have greater and greater popularity. She performed in Paris uh, four times in 1960, at, two times at a, a theater called the Palais de Chaillot, and the, second, the two other times at, at the Olympia. And uh, for her first shows at the Chaillot uh, Theater, uh, they were half empty, half full. <laughs> and uh, it was only because of the press uh, writing very jubilant articles and you know, good articles about her that she filled up the house at the Olympia the two evenings she was there. But uh, she, she's very, she's, she's way more respected today than she was, let's say, during the war years. And I think it's because um, people have learned more about her films, including The Wizard of Oz, of course, A Star is Born, and all of the other films, like, like Meet Me in St. Louis, too. So her popularity uh, has increased there, just like it's increased here, in fact, since she died in 1969. Yes? Well, there, there are people that compare them. <laughs> uh, I don't. Um, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, P.F., uh, uh, you know, P.F. was this fragile little figure in black, you know, standing on the stage with this incredible voice, and she barely moved. Whereas Garland, most of the time, was very emotional, and she was really moving around all the time. And... Uh, uh, she, Garland was also a wonderful dancer, too. And so for me, uh, they, they, don't, they don't resemble each other. Also, Piaf, I, I'm not an expert about Piaf, but uh, Piaf uh, came from a street tradition in France. She, she, uh, she, she used to sing on the streets in an area called Minilmonton uh, in the north part of Paris. And so she came from a different tradition from Garland. Garland started in vaudeville. And um, so th they really come from different traditions, although they're always compared to each other uh, because they died at the same age, and you know there's a certain tragic aura around both of them. And you know, uh, uh, Piaf was heavy, heavily into drugs, and Garland dr died of a drug overdose. So there are these <laughs> casual connections, but artistically, I don't place them on the same level. And that's not to say that Piaf was a, was was a, was a bad artist; she was a brilliant artist. But I, I just don't compare her to Garland. They're, I'm just thinking of the emotional vulnerability. They both personify that. Right? To some degree, yes. In that sense, yes. If you just want to look at it in terms of the emotion coming across, yes, I, you can say that, yes. But in terms of uh, their, their origins and, and their theatrical presentation, um, they're not the same, for me at least. Yeah? I was fortunate enough to hear her at the London Palladium in 1951. Oh. I was wondering whereabouts in her stage career did that fit? Was that the beginning of her stage career? Or yes, very much so. Well, it wasn't the, 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 the real beginning. Uh, the, the first concert Garland ever gave uh, was in 1943 uh, in Philadelphia. She gave one concert there with Andre Castellanos conducting. So that was the first time she was on stage. But when she, when she was fired from MGM, she didn't really know what to do anymore except go back to her vaudeville roots. 
And um, at that time, uh, she, she left for London with her own stage act, in very much in the same tradition as vaudeville. Uh, so uh, when she went to London in 51, uh, it, it was the first time after 1943 uh, that, that she had been on stage. But you mustn't forget, too, that uh, Garland did a tremendous amount of radio work, tremendous amount of radio work, something which I've worked with the past 10 years a lot. And uh, singing in front of people was nothing new for her. She had done it on the radio um, since 1935. And so... For live audiences, yeah. At that time, radio had live audiences. So um, she, she was used to being in front of people, but the Palladium 51 was the first time she, she really had an act on stage. Yes, and so that must have been wonderful. I'm, I'm envious. Yeah. I'm envious. Wonderful. I appreciate memory. you bringing it back for me. Yeah, I, I saw Garland in 65 and 67 in New York, and she was no longer at her peak as she was in 51. So it must have been a wonderful experience. Carnegie Hall, yes. If there's one, if, uh, if there's one album, just one, one thing, if you want to buy something by Garland, Carnegie Hall. Everything is there. It's all there, Carnegie Hall. So, yes? Could you comment about the, the relationship of her daughter, Eliza and Mother? They loved each other. <laughs> uh, she was, Garland was a great mother. Uh, she had uh, t uh, two, two, two daughters, Liza and Lorna, and then the son, Joe Luft. And uh, they were, uh, sh she, she was a terrific mother and loved her kids beyond anything. The, the trouble was that she couldn't feed them. I mean, it really got to the point w in the 60s where b between not making any money and uh, being thrown out of hotels and being, losing her house and things, she couldn't really take care of her kids anymore. So uh, L L Liza by then was, was an adult on her own, but the other two kids had to go back to their father, a guy named Sid Luft, who was a very strange character whom I knew. And, uh, uh, but Liza, Liza, for example, you know, at the end of Garland's life, uh, she was in New York in 1969, just a couple of weeks before she died. And Liza lived in New York, and they didn't see each other. Uh, Liza didn't. Liza emotionally couldn't take care of her mother anymore. I mean, Garland needed taking care of at the end of her life, and it was too much of an emotional charge for Liza. That's not to deny that, obviously, they loved each other deeply. I hope that answers your question. And no, no more questions. Yes. Um, do you have another career besides this? <laughs> <laughs> and my second question is that um, 1955 Can't Scope of Over the Rainbow is just emotionally it is. devastating. Do you know if that's on YouTube? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, I know. It's on YouTube, yeah. Of course it's on YouTube. Everything's on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also on DVD. Uh, the, uh, I'd have to check out on which DVD. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's on a DVD from about 10 years ago. And in terms of other things that I do, I, I do a lot of translating because I'm bilingual, so I do a lot of translating for musical websites. Um, I also produce. I've, I've produced a, a dozen or so CDs in the past 20, 22 years. And, uh, and before I came to this country, I was a producer on French public radio, too. So I, 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 uh, I, I do a lot of producing and also writing. I, I write for uh, a music magazine called the Arsk Journal. And I've, I've written for them since 1994 and do a lot of writing for them. So I um, no, this isn't the only thing I do, but it's my passion. That, uh, yeah. that sequence with her singing over the rainbow in the hobo Yes. That, that was on her first uh, television special in 1955. Yes. For which she was a little bit hoarse. I don't know if any of you noticed. Uh, she wasn't in perfect voice. And she, she had this stamina to, go, to use what she had. You know, because la later on she didn't, her voice wasn't, didn't hold up, you know, in the late 60s in particular. And she always gave it her all. And it's just incredible how she gets over her la lack of voice in, in, in that clip. Yeah. No, it's one of the great clips. That's, that's why I showed it. Yes. Yes. Anything else? Yeah. Please. Do you know what's happened to her children? What happened to her children? 
Wow. Well, I'll start with the least known, uh, Joey, whom I met once or twice. Um, uh, jo Joey was born after, what, what, she, uh, she was pregnant with Joey during A Star Is Born. And she was taking drugs and liquor during her pregnancy. And when Joey was born, he was born with only one lung inflated. They thought he was going to die. Uh, he, they inflated the second lung. He lived, but um, he had brain damage. He's very borderline. He's not at all in the business today. He's a very quiet kind of guy. He doesn't really have a career. He's, he's, he lives off the estate. Um, so so he's, he's the one that's least known. Lorna, Lorna has had a mediocre singing career. And unfortunately, she, she had breast cancer right now, and she's not doing very well, in fact. And, and then Liza, Liza's had a brilliant career. I, 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 don't, I don't talk much about, I don't talk at all about Liza in, in my talk. Uh, I, I don't connect Garland with Liza, uh, except that there's the mother and daughter. Uh, but Gar Liza has a wonderful voice. I mean, Cabaret is a wonderful movie. New York, New York was terrific. Uh, her stage shows over the decades have been, have been tremendous. Um, so Liza, and Liza doesn't have her, mother, have her mother's voice. She has kind of her mother's looks. But Liza has a completely different voice, and she's really done it on her own, I find. So uh, I like Liza. I'm not terribly passionate about Liza. She looks just like a father. She does look like Vincent Minnelli, absolutely. But she looks like a mix. And you take her some angles, it looks like the mother, and some other angles, it's the father. Yes. Yeah. You haven't mentioned anything about the movies with Mickey Rooney and their association. Well, they, they, they did, yeah, they did many, many movies in the late 30s, early 40s, all the Andy Hardy films, films like A Girl Crazy, uh, which are wonderful films to look at. I don't think any of them are really masterpieces. That's why they're, they're, they're fun movies, let's put on a show kind of movies. Uh, yeah. the, the only really interesting movie uh, with her and Mickey Rooney, I would say, is Girl Crazy from 1943, directed by Busby Berkeley. That's, that's a a lookable movie today. You know, you can really enjoy it. But the other ones are kind of, you know, Betsy Booth and, you know, all of these kind of fun movies, but not really, that don't really hold up today. But did they keep their relationship? Oh, they did. They did. In fact, on the TV show, uh, uh, Mickey Rooney was uh, her, her first guest. And even at the end when uh, she was dying, uh, Mickey Rooney wanted to, to take her in and start a school and you know, just, just take care of her a little bit. So they were friends till the end. Yes, they did. Yeah, they stayed friends. Anyone? No? Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.